We've gotten to the family of my some of my favorite minerals. These are the carbonates. In the textbook, the carbonates are on pages 400 to 403 as a general introduction, and then 407 to 416 for the systematic mineralogy. And it's a family of about 230 different minerals that share a lot of different features in common. We're going to talk about uh, six or seven of those that you're really going to be held accountable for. There are some general characteristics that we're going to deal with. So we're going to go general character here first. And the general character is really going to come down to that carbonate molecule. And how you get the carbonate molecule is with carbon, which is a four plus charge, bonding with three oxygen two minuses to get CO3, and the whole thing has a two minus charge. It's a range with a triangular structure where our carbon sits in the middle and we have our oxygens that come off at 120 degrees. And it's this structure, this triangular structure, and it's very different than the tetrahedral structure that we see as the basic building block for silicates and phosphates and sulfates. This is one reason why these minerals crystallize in the hexagonal system and the rhombohedral division of the hexagonal system. The other main general characteristic that we need to talk about is fizz. And you've probably seen this before in introductory classes, but there is a chemical reaction that occurs that releases CO2 when a carbonate is mixed with an acid. The reaction here, oh, we could show this as a picture, couldn't we? Here's a good picture of a calcite crystal that's had acid dropped on it, and you can see that that acid is bubbling. So the reason for this fizz is that there is a covalent bond in CO2 that is much, much stronger than the bonds that hold together CO3 to minus. And so when you add hydrogen to CO3, okay, so if you add hydrogen plus two CO3 to minus, to keep it balanced, we have to have two of these, then we get this reaction that occur where you get H2O plus CO2. And it's that CO2 that is in the form of gas that makes these bubbles. If we were to add cations to this to make it a little more realistic, well, then we'd add two hydrochloric acids plus a calcium carbonate generates a salt that is calcium chloride plus H2O plus CO2. That is just like one of the potential reactions, but you can take MnCO3 or FeCO3, any of the different carbonates, and do this chemical reaction. All right, that's our general character. And so what I want to do really for the rest of this lecture is explore the two CaCO3 polymorphs. Remember, a polymorph has a sim chemical formula, but a different structure. And there are two minerals that are very important that are called calcite and aragonite. And the way that this polymorph works is really controlled by the radius ratio and our coordination number. So here's how radius ratio is gonna work for our Ca oxygen relationship. The ratio here is one to 1.4, which gives us a radius ratio of 0.714, which is very close to the threshold of 0 0.732, which separates the octahedral arrangement from the cubic arrangement. So let's put octahedral, and here is cubic. So with a little change, a more dense or a less dense crystal structure, the packing of the calcium and the carbonate can have these two different structures. And what ends up happening is that the octahedral arrangement makes calcite, and the cubic arrangement makes aragonite. Now, with the triangular CA, or with the triangular CO3 arrangement, that octahedral calcite actually gets kind of shifted because of that triangle and becomes rhombohedral. And it the same triangle breaks down the cubic a little or makes it slightly less symmetric. So aragonite actually crystallizes in the orthorhombic system. Another thing to consider with the CaCO3 polymorphs is their stability and how that works with the global carbon cycle. So if we were to put in a phase diagram that differentiates, uh, oops, 
Oops, that's not supposed to be T, that's supposed to be P. Let's put that in, okay. So on the y-axis is pressure, and the x-axis is temperature, and we're measuring here in kilobars. So here's 5 kilobars, 10 kilobars, 15 kilobars, and the Earth's surface is down here. All right, so there's 0 at the Earth's surface. Temperature, here's 200, 400, 600. Well, there ends up being this stability field, or a phase boundary, that separates aragonite from calcite. And what this graph tells us is at the Earth's surface, down here, calcite is the stable polymorph. And aragonite is the high temperature polymorph. But there's some complexity here. And by the way, I'm introducing this kind of idea that I have written down in my notes, which is stability and global carbon cycle. Why is carbon part of this? Well, because of the carbon right here. And we care about carbon because we care about uh, global climate change. So based on the prediction, when we have shells and or based on this graph, when we have shells and corals precipitating from ocean water, you'd predict it'd be calcite. And if you were to make that prediction, you'd be wrong. And it's this really surprising thing. So what we're going to write here is we're going to say based on graph, based on graph, predict calcite makes shells and uh, coral. But that is wrong. How can we make that look wrong? We could put a big X in front of it. And Instead, aragonite does. And the reason why is not thermodynamics so much as kinetics. So the truth is, we're going to just write aragonite makes shells and coral because the high amount of magnesium in ocean water blocks calcite from being produced. So uh, let's see, how do we say that in a nice, clean way? We're going to say because Mg to calcium ratio is approximately 5 in ocean water. And the threshold, we'll go threshold for aragonite is 2. Is approximately 2. So ocean water is actually way, way higher in magnesium than what could stabilize calcite. And so this diagram kind of falls apart in ocean water. And instead, aragonite crystallizes. And we could say this, it's a metal, metastable. So thermodynamically, it shouldn't be stable, but it is in reality. So we'd call aragonite is a metastable phase. This is like a really fascinating reaction. There's a ton of different climactic effects and interplay that has to do on the world oceans because aragonite dissolves faster than calcite, which means you can, if you acidify the ocean water, you can dissolve aragonite faster, which is going to release more CO2, which is going to make more acid, which is going to create this big feedback cycle. But that's a part of a climate class and not mineralogy. So we're just going to move right along. Our first will be calcite. The chemical formula, of course, you know, CaCO3. And before we dive in deeper, let's go ahead and throw a picture up of calcite to distract and entertain as I write down the word mineralogy. The mineralogy, in terms of its hardness and specific gravity, aren't anything too amazing. It has a hardness of 3. It has a specific gravity that we would call normal, right around 2.7. But calcite does have all sorts of fascinating mineralogical information about it. One thing is that there's about 300 different forms that calcite can take. That's a crazy high number. But the most common are going to be the rhombohedron, which we see here, and the scalenohedron. But it's funny, the shape of the scalenohedron ends up making these kind of pointed pyramids, which are called dog tooth. So we're going to write down that the most common forms are massive or rhombohedrons or dog tooth. And parentheses around dog tooth is that this is the scalenohedron. Another word that is used for calcite a lot is the word spar. So if you ever hear about someone talking about uh, dog tooth spar, well, they're talking about calcite that's somewhat clear. That's what spar means. 
uh, the way that it breaks and it twins? Well, there is a rhombohedral cleavage, perfect rhombohedral cleavage, that is very famous in calcite. And the other thing about it is that it will mechanically twin, which means if you put pressure on the crystal, it will create twinning planes. And this is going to become really important as we study petrography, which is the study of rocks in thin section um, using microscopes, because one way to identify calcite is by looking and finding all of these mechanical twins that are produced. And then the last aspect of calcite's mineralogy that I think is too important to pass up is this concept of birefringence. And this is the first time you're going to hear about birefringence. You're going to hear a lot about it in later classes in your geologic careers. And so let's introduce it to you now using calcite. And what ends up happening with calcite, uh, let's see, maybe I go red here. Let me go with a little bit of red. The incoming light is here. And because calcite has two different indexes of refractions, which is the speed at which light moves through a crystal, it has an index of refraction, let's say, in this direction, and it'll have an index of refraction that's different in this direction. And that means light moves through it at different speeds. And so this one laser light enters the crystal, and you can see that it turns into one ray and two rays. And the difference of those two rays upon exiting the crystal is kind of the idea of birefringence. So let's say here that, that calcite has a very high birefringence. And the birefringence has to do with, well, it has, okay, yeah, let's do it this way. Two indices of refraction. That slow light differently. And because they slow light differently, they separate the light into two paths. So we're gonna, we could say, uh, in your notes, what should you have? Your notes, you should have a rhombohedron that's drawn. And that rhombohedron will have one ray coming down into it. One ray. And it will be, that one ray will be split into two rays. And if you get that for mineralogy, then you've got enough to work with as you go into your next level. All right, as we move into the geology of calcite, it's almost like there's too much to say. This is why calcite is arguably my favorite mineral. It is a rock forming mineral. Anytime we're talking about the rock forming minerals, there's so much that we could say geologically. Well, we'll just introduce parts of it. One is that limestone and chalk is made of calcite. And so these are the marine organisms. Hold on, Professor. You just told me just a few minutes ago that because of this weird magnesium to calcium ratio of 5, aragonite gets made. That's true initially, but aragonite is metastable. So as that rock sits at the Earth's surface for a long period of time, that aragonite will diagenetically change into calcite. What does diagenetic mean? It just means like sedimentary process. So we're going to say um, uh, diagenetic conversion that's of aragonite to calcite. So that's why when you look in the rock record, all limestones and chalks out there nowadays, they're just all calcite. And so when you picture this, this is what I want you to have in your mind. Stuff like chalk, the white cliffs of Dover, it's all made of these little tiny marine suckers, organisms. Okay, uh, the next is caves. Another word for rocks in caves is a higher level one than maybe you've learned so far. Speleothems. These are cave rocks. And so these are formed from waters bearing dissolved calcium and carbonate. Anywhere you go. This is primarily going to be in lands that have a lot of limestone as a starting material to deal with. But this is material that has been re-precipitated. So you can see the cracks of the roof of this cave have the stalactites hanging down. Oh, what's hanging down? Tights or mites? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Stalactites and stalagmites. Other rocks would be marbles. A marble is a metamorphic rock. So we're gonna say metamorphic limestone. And there's even these weird magmas that are really rich in CO2 called carbon, carbon, itites. 
And these are just weird CO2 rich magmas from the mantle. So there's a lot of different environments where you can get calcite. And there's similarly huge amounts of significance to calcite in our economy and in our world. I don't know which one to choose, so I just chose cement or concrete. This ends up being so important for building our world. And the way to make cement is kind of a, well, it's a multi-step process, but it's not too hard. You have to mine calcium and you heat that calcium to around 450 degrees Celsius. When you do that, you make a material called lime plus CO2. So this is lime. Well, this CO2 is actually one of the world's hugest pollutants. Pollutants. And the production of CO2 makes, it's estimated, around 8% of all CO2 that is emitted to the atmosphere. And this is a major uh, climate change gas. So uh, we call it a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas. That alone makes this whole process interesting. Well, the next thing you have to do is you take that lime and you mix it with some clay and some gypsum and some silica and some water. And once you've done that, you're going to get it to set and harden and turn into this uh, you know, thing that we all walk on all the time. So that whole process it's basically a calcium hydroxide type mineral that can set. And when we say set, we mean harden. And now before we finish, I just think we should mention aragonite just a bit. Um, here's a picture. Here's a beautiful picture of aragonite. Real. <coughs> and it introduces for us one of the most important things about aragonite is that it is in the orthorhombic system, 2 over m, 2 over m, 2 over m. But look at these crystals. If you actually look at them, they're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sides. So because of a twin law that occurs, the orthorhombic crystals actually produce uh, hexagonal crystals. So, but twinning produces hexagonal crystals. I found that to be one of the interesting things about aragonite. And another is that it makes shells and all these different organisms. And sometimes the arrangement of little aragonite plates, so we're going to say aragonite plates, microcrystalline aragonite plates, will sometimes form in these little organisms and will diff uh, uh, we'll say diffract light, like the back of a CD. And we get really beautiful play of color in the form of pearl or mother of pearl. And so you can have mother of pearl. You can actually have aragonite as a gemstone. And to finish off, let's see, here's one picture showing shells, modern shells that are now all crystallized of aragonite. Give them a million years and they'll turn into calcite. But for now, they're aragonite. And the same thing is true for pearls. All that beautiful iridescence that we see on the surface of pearls has to do with little plates of aragonite that are all arranged just right.